Assalamu alaikum and welcome back to Women's AM. This morning I'm joined by sisters Nusrat, Ayan and Saida to discuss the balance between Islamic and worldly knowledge. Sister Ayan, I'm going to come to you now. Hey. <laughs> this is such a fantastic topic and I really enjoyed the discussion we had before the break. But what I want to talk a bit about now is what are the categories of fard knowledge, so obligatory knowledge, that, that we kind of all should be learning? Okay, so the thing is that we know as Muslims that um, knowledge is obligatory upon everyone that we have to keep seeking knowledge and then that falls into two parts so we have Fard al-Ain which is um, knowledge that's compulsory on every single Muslim and then there's Fard al-Kifaya which is knowledge that is needed by certain people in the community and then that sort of responsibility drops off everyone else so for example in Fard al-Ain which is the um, obligation upon every single Muslim is things like um, worship, fasting, uh, zakat, all of these things that are obligatory within the deen that we know that we have to do um, is then um, is then uh, shown through the fact that we have to learn how to do these things. So this is why it's Fard al Ain. But Fard al Kifaya will be things like, say, for example, within the community, you'll need doctors, you'll need uh, builders, you'll need all sorts of things. So that's a, a, a communal sort of uh, responsibility. So if you have few people within the community coming forward to be able to uh, study these things and then do these things, mm -hmm. then you've got that obligation sorted out as well. So yeah. it's not for everyone to do. So um, we've got Imam al Ghazali, mashallah. Allah who categorized and classified knowledge into two parts so one which was uh, revealed knowledge and non revealed knowledge so revealed knowledge was to do with the knowledge that we received um, f through the Prophet so divine revelation and then there was the non revealed which was to do with things that we learn through observation and experimentation and I think that um, being able to distinguish both is good but then also um, knowing that the two are so interconnected yeah. so you cannot do anything in life without you having some sort mm. of um, uh, drive to seek knowledge. I think this is the nice thing about Islam, isn't it? It's so kind of all-encompassing that, you know, you can't really have one without the other, isn't it? Absolutely. I mean, you know, like I was saying before, really, it, whatever you study, whatever you learn, and, and in fact, you know, as Muslims, we have this wonderful opportunity to be rewarded by Allah for everything that we do. Yes. If you study yeah. your, your religion, then you know you sleep in the right way, even that has reward. Absolutely. You know, you eat in the right way. And so I think in some ways, if we if we study we maximize the reward that we have in this life and who yeah. doesn't want to do that yeah that's absolutely true everything we do can be turned into an act of ibadah mashallah so you know again that kind of encompasses all things so what more you know motivation could we need but I think sometimes it can be um, you know kind of detrimental to pursue education in only one of these categories mm -hmm. what do you think is the driving force behind this um, sister Nasrat? I think the driving force as to why we push particularly in society we live in sec um, world education is actually pushed more as opposed to religion it goes back to what I was saying about the societal setup that religion and how it, and its functionings are, are mutually exclusive the fact yeah. that we should privatize our practice of religion and just keep it to the home but so by default that's obviously going to um, translate into the framework of education so we look at for example the way RE religious studies is treated in schools if you fail it for example many people don't regard it as a big deal or whatever even some teachers and students show very flippant and nonchalant attitudes towards that I remember when I was in school particularly there was um, a boy that actually wanted to enter the priesthood and a girl actually that wanted to enter the nunnery and people thought they that they were kind of odd because they yeah. wanted to do that mm -hmm. and this is within Catholic education as well Wow they actually thought that which actually shows that by virtue of, I think for me anyway from my observation that's when I knew that that's naturally now the separation <laughs> of acquiring religious and secular knowledge but I think it's detrimental to push only for religious knowledge as well if you're only looking at it from any religious perspective because you lose a sense of intense realism yeah. so intense realism in the sense of you need to know how your how the world functions so mm -hmm. the society the people you're interacting with governance bureaucratic structures within employment and other places as well if you don't have that but you have Islamic knowledge how can you actually use what you know and especially in a society where corruption is quite rife, how can you use your Islamic knowledge to try and rectify and affect a good? Because in joining in the good and forbidding in the, in the evil is actually a forward upon us. Yeah. So it's more conducive for the alim to use their knowledge in a way that benefits society and contributes towards society in that kind of way as well. There's one girl I know actually where her father consistently dissuades her from pursuing a secular education because he's fallen into the idea of um, worldly education and um, 
religion being mutually exclusive mm -hmm. but also if you push for secular education only you are the equilibrium needs to be there basically you, yeah. look, you lose one sense of purpose of life and if you haven't got that how will you navigate because through our through our religious knowledge we gain divine revelation uh, we gain divine guidance of how to na navigate through the worldly sense as well but I think it's important to understand as well mm -hmm. is that um, in the West you do have the sort of historical baggage where it was the the uh, the event of religion and state sort of separating came about because of sort of the corruption that even you found within sort of the religious um, you know the religious uh, what do you call it uh, establishment. <laughs> establishment exactly mm -hmm. so then this is why you find that people are very much opposed to mixing religion and governance together is because of this historical baggage yeah. which is something that we've never had as Muslims but well, I think this is absolutely true you know as Muslims if we look into our past we see you know so many people mashallah that very successfully were able to you know balance and combine this this kind of seeking of religious and um, you know, kind of secular, uh, worldly knowledge as well. All, all of the Sahabas, you know, the, the, exactly. the, they all had a trade, yes. you know, but we know them for their Islamic heritage that they've given to yep. us, but they all had a trade, they were all working, they were all contributing to society, and we, I think we've forgotten that we should be striving to do that. Yes. You know, and, yes. and it, it, it has to be a balance between both uh, worldly knowledge and Islamic knowledge, yes. because you go either way, you know, you, you tip the balance to much. For example, there's imams that are out there who are, have no real understanding of the world around them, and I think they're giving advice that's detrimental to the needs of their community, and mm -hmm. at the same time, you've got Absolutely. medics out there, let's say, who are giving advice on the basis of lack of Islamic knowledge. I think this you know? is absolutely true, and you know, if it's even when we look at, you know, the four great um, imams, mm -hmm. um, Abu mm -hmm. Hanifa, for example, you know, he was obviously, he's known for his, um, you know, knowledge of Islam and, and Islamic jurisprudence, but, but he was, you know, he was a wealthy merchant a businessman Absolutely. and he would give grants to his students to facilitate them you know kind of furthering their education as well yeah. Khadija bin Khwalid uh, the wife of the Prophet she was a businesswoman but still maintained her Islamic principles and values as well in a way that not only that gives doubt to non-Muslims but it just, just exemplifies how worldly knowledge and uh, religious knowledge and, and practice in everyday life is not something mutually exclusive. I think we need to come out of that mindset of that. Uh, yeah. that yeah. Yeah, absolutely. No, we do. We need to move away from that mm -hmm. and move more into the, you know, example of some of the uh, Muslims from the past. Um, Ayan, can you give us yeah, uh, some examples? I mean, we've got uh, Ibn Sina, for example, and he's a very, mm -hmm. very famous philosopher, and he dealt with uh, reason and reality, and he, um, and how it was possible for individuals to come to uh, an ultimate truth about um, the world and being and God and the funny th well not funny but the great thing about him was is that whenever he was stuck in a rut in terms of his work um, he would always pray uh, to Raka of Salat to kind of yeah. give him that balance to give him that inspiration to ask Allah you know for that for that guidance to yeah. continue his work I think the reason why we don't have that today is because we do have that separation between religion and and other knowledge yeah is that we yeah. don't see it as Islam as being a holistic way of life because mm. Islam is not just about individual acts of worship it's about worship in the collective and holistic sense. So, for example, like we were saying, as medical doctors, you're out there trying to help the community. But as a Muslim, it's not just about, you know, being a doctor. It's about also being out there to help the community with the intention of, you know, uh, pleasing Allah as well. And I think we've moved away from that. We've moved away from having that zeal, that sincerity with the intention of pleasing Allah in whatever sort of path we take. Yeah, it's really interesting. So I'm studying Arabic at the moment, and the word Ajr means reward, but yeah. I did not realize that actually Ajr means reward in two senses. The first definition is the reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and the second definition is your pay packet. That's oh, interesting. Isn't it interesting. That's yeah. interesting. And this, this is the understanding of the Arabic language that we miss. You know, we miss these kind of little nuances so often. Yeah. Um, so, Sister Zadie, I just want a final take-home message from you. You know, for some advice as how we, as parents or individuals or within the community, can get this balance right or can promote that that balanced thinking. I, I would say. Try, always try and do both you know try and be the best Muslim that you can possibly be for example if you don't understand the words that you're saying in your salah it's an excellent starting point for you you know understand what you're saying so that you can connect with Allah better yeah. within your prayer yeah. and then just slowly move on from that you know it doesn't matter what your beginning point is yeah. and if you're a scholar and you've got amazing knowledge at that end and you don't really understand how you know you to relate to your community again just try and get out there and speak to people and find out and yeah. 
strike the balance that that's all we need you know absolutely Jazakallah that's well, such a fantastic you. tip and inshallah I will be implementing that myself uh, sister Ayan have you got a final take-home tip on how we can get the balance right inshallah? yeah I think just check your intention everything comes mm. down to intention and I think when you've got the right intentions and that being with the ultimate goal of pleasing Allah and drawing closer toward him then you can't go wrong in whatever path you take but I think always having that balance because Islam came as a middle path it didn't come to be left or right so I think maintain that balance have the right intention absolutely intention is a very good reminder Jazakallah how is this undoubtedly acquiring knowledge of the Deen is important and especially for women who are raising the next generation our responsibility is to seek out all forms of beneficial knowledge and the way we know the knowledge is beneficial is if it leads us to appreciate Allah and love Allah that much more I will leave you with the dua of the Prophet peace be upon him oh Allah I ask you for knowledge that will benefit me this has been such an informative discussion and it really is an important topic but if you've missed any of it all is not lost because you can catch the repeat tomorrow morning at 6 a.m. inshallah and of course you can catch all of the highlights from this week's shows on Sunday at 3 p.m. we're off for another break now but do stay tuned as we'll be back with our last segment when we'll be talking about sleep routines for babies we can all appreciate how stressful it can be when we're sleep deprived so how can we make sure that mummy and baby are getting enough rest stay tuned to find out after the break assalamu alaikum